Chapter Twenty Six of the Red and the Black, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. The Red and the Black, Volume One by Stondar. Translated by Horace B. Samuel. Chapter Twenty Six. The World, or What the Rich Lack. I am alone in the world. No one deigns to spare me a thought. All those whom I see make their fortune have an insolence and hardness of heart, which I do not feel in myself. They hate me by reason of kindness and good humour. Oh, I shall die soon, either from starvation or the unhappiness of seeing men so hard of heart. Young. He hastened to brush his clothes and run down. He was late. Instead of trying to justify himself, Julien crossed his arms over his breast. Peccavi pater optime, I have sinned, I confess my fault, O oh my father, he said with a contrite air. This first speech was a great success. The clever ones among the seminarists saw that they had to deal with a man who knew something about the elements of the profession. The recreation hour arrived, and Julien saw that he was the object of general curiosity but he only manifested reserved silence. Following the maxims he had laid down for himself, he considered his three hundred and twenty-one comrades as enemies. The most dangerous of all in his eyes was the Abbe Pirard. A few days afterwards, Julien had to choose a confessor and was given a list. Great heavens! What do they take me for? he said to himself. Do they think I don't understand what's what? Then he chose the Abbe Pirard. This step proved decisive, without his suspecting it. A little seminarist, who was quite young and a native of Verrières, and who had declared himself his friend since the first day, informed him that he would probably have acted more prudently if he had chosen M. Castaned, the sub-director of the seminary. The Abbe Castaned is the enemy of Pirard, who is suspected of Jansenism, added the little seminarist in a whisper. All the first steps of our hero were, in spite of the prudence on which he plumed himself, as much mistakes as his choice of a confessor. Misled as he was by all the self-confidence of a man of imagination, he took his projects for facts, and believed that he was a consummate hypocrite. His folly went so far as to reproach himself for his success in this kind of weakness. Alas! it is my only weapon, he said to himself. At another period I should have earned my livelihood by eloquent deeds in the face of the enemy. As satisfied as he was with his own conduct, Julien looked around him. He found everywhere the appearance of the purest virtue. Eight or ten seminarists lived in the odour of sanctity, and had visions like St. Teresa and St. Francis, when he received his stigmata on Mount Vernia in the Apennines. But it was a great secret, and their friends concealed it. These poor young people who had visions were always in the infirmary, a hundred others combined an indefatigable application to a robust faith. They worked till they fell ill, but without learning much. Two or three were distinguished by a real talent, amongst others a student of the name of Chazelle, but both they and Julien felt mutually unsympathetic. The rest of these three hundred and twenty-one seminarists consisted exclusively of coarse persons, who were by no means sure of understanding the Latin words which they kept on repeating the live-long day. Nearly all were the sons of peasants, and they preferred to gain their livelihood by reciting some Latin words than by ploughing the earth. It was after this examination of his colleagues that Julien, during the first few days, promised himself a speedy success. Intelligent people are needed in every service, he said to himself, for after all there is work to be done. I should have been a sergeant under Napoleon. I shall be a grand vicar among these future cures. All these poor devils, he added, manual labourers, as they have been since their childhood, have lived on curded milk and black bread up till they arrived here. They would only eat meat five or six times a year in their hovels. Like the Roman soldiers who used to find war the time of rest, these poor peasants are enchanted with the delights of the seminary. Julien could never read anything in their gloomy eyes but the satisfaction of physical craving after dinner and the expectation of sensual pleasure before the meal. Such were the people among whom Julien had to distinguish himself. But the fact which he did not know, 
and which they refrained from telling him, was that coming out first in the different courses of dogma, ecclesiastical history, etc., etc., which are taken at the seminary, constituted in their eyes neither more nor less than a splendid sin. Since the time of Voltaire and two-chamber government, which is at bottom simply distrust and personal self-examination, and gives the popular mind that bad habit of being suspicious, the Church of France seems to have realised that books are its real enemies. It is the submissive heart which counts for everything in its eyes. It suspects, and rightly so, any success in studies, even sacred ones. What is to prevent a superior man from crossing over to the opposite side, like Sier or Gregory? The trembling church clings on to the Pope as its one chance of safety. The Pope alone is in a position to attempt to paralyse all personal self-examination, and to make an impression by means of the pompous piety of his court ceremonial on the bored and morbid spirit of fashionable society. Julien, as he began to get some glimpse of these various truths, which are none the less in total contradiction to all the official pronouncements of any seminary, fell into a profound melancholy. He worked a great deal, and rapidly succeeded in learning things which were extremely useful to a priest, extremely false in his own eyes, and devoid of the slightest interest for him. He felt there was nothing else to do. Am I then forgotten by the whole world, he thought? He did not know that M. Pirard had received and thrown into the fire several letters with the Dijon stamp, in which the most lively passion would pierce through the most formal conventionalism of style. This love seems to be fought by great attacks of remorse. All the better, thought the Abbe Pirard. At any rate, this lad has not loved an infidel woman. One day the Abbe Pirard opened a letter which seemed half blotted out by tears. It was an adieu for ever. At last, said the writer to Julien, heaven has granted me the grace of hating, not the author of my fall, but my fall itself. The sacrifice has been made, dear one, not without tears, as you see. The safety of those to whom I must devote my life, and whom you love so much, is the decisive factor. A just but terrible God will no longer see his way to avenge on them their mother's crimes. Adieu, Julien. Be just towards all men. The end of the letter was nearly entirely illegible. The writer gave an address at Dijon, but at the same time expressed the hope that Julien would not answer, or at any rate would employ language which a reformed woman could read without blushing. Julien's melancholy, aggravated by the mediocre nourishment which the contractor who gave dinners at thirteen centimes per head supplied to the seminary, began to affect his health, when Fouquet suddenly appeared in his room one morning. I have been able to get in at last. I have duly been five times to Besançon in order to see you. Could never get in. I put someone by the door to watch. Why the devil don't you ever go out? It is a test which I have imposed on myself. I find you greatly changed. But here you are again. I have just learned from a couple of good five-franc pieces that I was only a fool not to have offered them on my first journey. The conversation of the two friends went on for ever. Julien changed colour, where Fouquet said to him, Do you know, by the by, that your pupil's mother has become positively devout? And he began to talk in that off-hand manner, which makes so singular an impression on the passionate soul, whose dearest interests are being destroyed, without the speaker having the faintest suspicion of it. Yes, my friend, the most exalted devoutness. She is said to make pilgrimages. But to the eternal shame of the Abbe Maslon, who has played the spy so long on that poor Monsieur Chelon, Madame de Renal would have nothing to do with him. She goes to confession to Dijon or Besançon. She goes to Besançon, said Julien, flushing all over his forehead. Pretty often, said Fouquet, in a questioning manner. Have you got any constitutionnel on you? What do you say? replied Fouquet. I am asking if you've got any constitutionnel, went on Julien, in the quietest tone imaginable. They cost thirty sous a number here. What? exclaimed Fouquet. Liberals, even in the seminary? Poor France, he added, assuming the Abbe Maslon's hypocritical voice and the sugary tone. This visit would have made a deep impression on our hero, 
if he had not been put on the track of an important discovery by some words addressed to him the following day by the little seminarist from Verrières. Julien's conduct since he had been at the seminary had been nothing but a series of false steps. He began to make bitter fun of himself. In point of fact, the important actions in his life had been cleverly managed, but he was careless about details, and cleverness in a seminary consists in attention to details. Consequently, he had already the reputation among his comrades of being a strong-minded person. He had been betrayed by a number of little actions. He had been convicted in their eyes of this enormity. He thought and judged for himself, instead of blindly following authority and example. The Abbe Pirard had been no help to him. He had not spoken to him on a single occasion, apart from the confessional, and even there he listened more than he spoke. Matters would have been very different if he had chosen the Abbe Castanet. The moment that Julien realised his folly, he ceased to be bored. He wished to know the whole extent of the evil, and to effect this emerged a little from that haughty, obstinate silence with which he had scrupulously rebuffed his comrades. It was now that they took their revenge on him. His advances were welcomed by a contempt verging on derision. He realised that there had not been one single hour from the time of his entry into the seminary, particularly during recreation time, which had not resulted in affecting him one way or another, which had not increased the number of his enemies, or won for him the goodwill of some seminarist, who was either sincerely virtuous, or of a fibre slightly less coarse than that of the others. The evil to repair was infinite, and the task very difficult. Henceforth, Julien's attention was always on guard. The problem before him was to map out a new character for himself. The moving of his eyes, for example, occasioned him a great deal of trouble. It is with good reason that they are carried lowered in these places. How presumptuous I was at Verrières, said Julien to himself. I thought I lived. I was only preparing for life, and here I am at last in the world such as I shall find it, until my part comes to an end, surrounded by real enemies. What immense difficulties, he added, are involved in keeping up this hypocrisy every single minute. It is enough to put the labours of Hercules into the shade. The Hercules of modern times is the Pope Sixtus Quintus, who deceived by his modesty fifteen years on end forty cardinals, who had seen the liveliness and haughtiness of his whole youth. So knowledge is nothing here, he said to himself with disgust. Progress in doctrine, in sacred history, etc., only seem to count. Everything said on those subjects is only intended to entrap fools like me. Alas, my only merit consists in my rapid progress, and in the way in which I grasp all their nonsense. Do they really value those things at their true worth? Do they judge them like I do? And I have the stupidity to be proud of my quickness. The only result of my coming out top has been to give me inveterate enemies. A Chazelle, who really knows more than I do, always throws some blunder in his compositions, which gets him put back to the fiftieth place. If he comes out first, it is only because he is absent-minded. Oh, how useful would one word, just one word of Monsieur Pirard, have been to me! As soon as Julien was disillusioned, the long exercises in ascetic piety, such as the attendances in the chapel five times a week, the intonation of hymns at the chapel of the Sacré Coeur, etc., etc., which had previously seemed to him so deadly boring, became his most interesting opportunities for action. Thanks to a severe introspection, and above all by trying not to overdo his methods, Julien did not attempt at the outset to perform significant actions, that is to say, actions which are proof of a certain Christian perfection, like those seminarists who served as a model to the rest. Seminarists have a special way, even of eating a poached egg, which betokens progress in the devout life. The reader who smiles at this will perhaps be good enough to remember all the mistakes which the Abbe de Lille made over the eating of an egg, when he was invited to breakfast with a lady of the court of Louis the Sixteenth. Julien first tried to arrive at the state of non culpa, that is to say the state of the young seminarist whose demeanour and manner of moving his arms, eyes, etc., 
while in fact without any trace of worldliness, do not yet indicate that the person is entirely absorbed by the conception of the other world, and the idea of the pure nothingness of this one. Julien incessantly found such phrases as these, charcoaled on the walls of the corridors. What are sixty years of ordeals, balanced against an eternity of delights, or an eternity of boiling oil in hell? He despised them no longer. He realized that it was necessary to have them incessantly before his eyes. What am I going to do all my life, he said to himself. I shall sell to the faithful a place in heaven. How am I going to make that place visible to their eyes? By the difference between my appearance and that of a layman. After several months of absolutely unremitting application, Julien still had the appearance of thinking. The way in which he would move his eyes and hold his mouth did not betoken that implicit faith which is ready to believe everything and undergo everything, even at the cost of martyrdom. Julien saw with anger that he was surpassed in this by the coarsest peasants, and there was good reason for their not appearing full of thought. What pains did he not take to acquire that facial expression of blindly fervent faith which is found so frequently in the Italian convents, and of which Le Guéchin has left such perfect models in his church pictures for the benefit of us laymen? On feast days the seminarists were regaled with sausages and cabbage. Julien's table neighbours observed that he did not appreciate this happiness. That was looked upon as one of his paramount crimes. His comrades saw in this a most odious trait, and the most foolish hypocrisy. Nothing made him more enemies. Look at this bourgeois, look at this stuck-up person, they would say, who pretends to despise the best rations there are, sausages and cabbage. Shame on the villain! The haughty wretch! He's damned for ever. Alas, these young peasants, who are my comrades, find their ignorance an immense advantage, Julien would exclaim in his moments of discouragement. The professor has not got to deliver them on their arrival at the seminary from that awful number of worldly ideas which I brought into it, and which they read on my face whatever I do. Julien watched with an attention bordering on envy the coarsest of the little peasants who arrived at the seminary from the moment when they were made to doff their shabby jackets to don the black robe their education consisted of an immense and limitless respect for hard liquid cash as they say in franche comte that is the consecrated and heroic way of expressing the sublime idea of current money these seminarists like the heroes of voltaire's novels found their happiness in dining well julien discovered in nearly all of them an innate respect for the man who wears a suit of good cloth. This sentiment appreciates the distributive justice which is given us at our courts, at its value, or even above its true value. What can one gain, they would often repeat among themselves, by having a lawsuit with a big man? That is the expression current in the valleys of the Jura to express a rich man. One can judge of their respect for the richest entity of all, the government. Failure to smile deferentially at the mere name of Monsieur the Prefect is regarded as an imprudence in the eyes of the Franche Comte peasant, and imprudence in poor people is quickly punished by lack of bread. After having been almost suffocated at first by his feeling of contempt, Julien eventually experienced a feeling of pity. It often happened that the fathers of most of his comrades would enter their hovel in winter evenings and fail to find there either bread chestnuts or potatoes. What is there astonishing, then, Julien would say to himself, if in their eyes the happy man is in the first place the one who has just had a good dinner, and in the second place the one who possesses a good suit? My comrades have a lasting vocation. That is to say, they see in the ecclesiastical calling a long continuance of the happiness of dining well and having a warm suit. Julien happened to hear a young imaginative seminarist say to his companion, Why shouldn't I become Pope like Sixtus Quintus, who kept pigs? They only make Italians popes, answered his friend. But they will certainly draw lots amongst us for the great vicarships, canonries, and perhaps bishoprics. Monsieur P., Bishop of Clon, is the son of a cooper. 
That's what my father is. One day, in the middle of a theology lesson, the Abbe Pirard summoned Julien to him. The young fellow was delighted to leave the dark moral atmosphere in which he had been plunged. Julien received from the director the same welcome which had frightened him so much on the first day of his entry. "'Explain to me what is written on this playing card,' he said, looking at him in a way calculated to make him sink into the earth. Julien read, "'Amanda Binet of the Giraffe Café before eight o'clock. Say you're from jean Lee and my mother's cousin.' Julien realised the immense danger. The spies of the Abbe Castanet had stolen the address. "'I was trembling with fear the day I came here,' he answered, looking at the Abbe Pirard's forehead, for he could not endure that terrible gaze. M. Chelon told me that this is a place of informers and mischief-makers of all kinds, and that spying and tale-bearing by one comrade on another was encouraged by the authorities. Heaven wishes it to be so, so as to show life such as it is to the young priests, and fill them with disgust for the world and all its pomps. "'And it's to me that you make these fine speeches,' said the Abbe Pirard furiously. "'You young villain!' "'My brothers used to beat me at Verrières,' answered Julien coldly, when they had occasion to be jealous of me. "'Indeed! Indeed!' exclaimed M. Pirard, almost beside himself. Julien went on with his story, without being in the least intimidated. "'The day of my arrival at Besançon I was hungry, and I entered a café. My spirit was full of revulsion for so profane a place, but I thought that my breakfast would cost me less than at an inn. A lady, who seemed to be the mistress of the establishment, took pity on my inexperience. Besançon is full of bad characters, she said to me. I fear something will happen to you, sir. If some mishap should occur to you, have recourse to me and send to my house before eight o'clock. If the porters of the seminary refuse to execute your errand, Say you are my cousin and a native of jean Lee. "'I will have all this chatter verified,' exclaimed the Abbe Pirard, unable to stand still, and walking about the room. "'Back to the cell!' The Abbe followed Julien and locked him in. The latter immediately began to examine his trunk, at the bottom of which the fatal cards had been so carefully hidden. Nothing was missing in the trunk, but several things had been disarranged. Nevertheless, he had never been without the key. What luck that, during the whole time of my blindness, said Julien to himself, I never veiled myself of the permission to go out that M. Castanet would offer me so frequently, with a kindness which I now understand. Perhaps I should have had the weakness to have changed my clothes and gone to see the fair Amanda, and then I should have been ruined. When they gave up hope of exploiting that piece of information for the accomplishments of his ruin, they had used it to inform against him. Two hours afterwards, the director summoned him. "'You did not lie,' he said to him, with a less severe look. "'But keeping an address like that is an indiscretion of a gravity which you are unable to realise. "'Unhappy child! It may perhaps do you harm in ten years' time.'" End of chapter 26